Thank you, Anil. So uh, I am from the Department of Energy off, and I get asked the question, what's the Department of Energy uh, doing with plastics? Why, why are you interested in it? That, the answer to that is really twofold. One is that I think we bring a lot of capabilities to this problem in terms of the chemistry and materials. So I'll talk about that some first. The second is that uh, there is an energy footprint, footprint to plastics that I'll talk about as well. All right. I think this one should work to advance. It does. All right. Uh, so just, uh, again, what, what is BES? Basically, I'm, part, I'm the part of DOE that's called Basic Energy Sciences. As the name implies, this is about fundamental research aimed at understanding, uh, predicting, and ultimately controlling energy and matter at the level of electrons, atoms, and molecules, right? So that's where we start. But uh, if you're going to address problems like plastics, you got to get beyond that, right? And uh, how do you take that knowledge at a very fundamental level and translate it into real world systems? And that's part of what we do. Um, so there's two components to this, materials and chemistry. Um, let me just, uh, there, there are, so the, the, the chemistry part, uh, there are 25 actually core programs that are funded uh, through BES. The chem sciences part, that's the one I know the best since I'm the division director for that uh, activity. Um, that, there are a few programs, but two in particular that are really relevant. Uh, we fund, we probably the, one of the largest funders in the U.S. of catalysis science, which is a, an enabler in terms of chemical transformations. And the other is separations uh, at the molecular scale. Um, on the materials side, there are two programs, uh, materials chemistry and biomolecular materials that are really focused on being able to design and synthesize novel materials, and they do a lot of work on understanding polymers. And so, uh, as you can see, this is a, a fairly large uh, program, three, uh, three quarters of a billion dollars per year goes into research in these areas. Um, the other thing that we bring is actually unique capabilities. Um, another part of, of basic energy sciences is um, the scientific user facilities. They, they support uh, 12 scientific user facilities. Uh, five of those are um, synchrotron light sources uh, that push photons, x-rays. Right, that can be used for characterization, two uh, neutron sources, and five nanoscale science research centers. All of those actually, I think, will play an important role in helping us understand uh, the processes and the materials that uh, are used in upcycling. And again, uh, a, a large budget goes into supporting those. Um, I direct your attention to the top right, uh, the top bullet there. Access to this, all of these facilities, is free, right? Uh, it takes a, pr a proposal, and uh, it's free for non-proprietary research. You can still do proprietary research, but it'll cost you. All right, um, so let me move then to the main uh, topic, which is upcycling of polymers. This is really about revolutionizing the life cycle of, pol of plastics. So um, everybody's seen this. The, the, whole, the whole idea here is that plastics are essential today, right? They're not going to go away. Um, and I think that we need to figure out how to deal with what we're making today, and we need to figure out how to make replacements for what we're making today. Both of those are really important. But still, we have a, a big backlog <laughs> of plastics, and it's, gonna, and it's continuing to come. And it's in all of our sectors, right? Uh, the household items, it's in our electronics. It's, you know, on the, the case of your cell phone is, uh, of your, of your phones are now plastic, but even inside the circuit boards include plastic materials, right? Um, even, you know, uh, the construction materials now, a lot of them are plastics. Uh, the spool that's at the bottom, I, you know, when I first saw that, I said, all right, fishing line, right? Uh, fly fishing line, right? Um, but it's not. It's actually, it's the feed for, uh, for digital printing, 
right, for us, which is uh, being used a lot for making materials. So again, plastics, they're, they're everywhere, and this, this is recognized globally. So I won't spend much time, but, uh, you know, it, there's been lots of articles about how important this is. And I think the, the encouraging thing is that science is starting to be done to really understand how to convert plastics. So uh, again, um, I think it, it points to what needs to be done and some of the uh, initial things that are being done. So you've seen a lot of this. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'll just point out a couple of points. One is this uh, number of 400 uh, million metric tons that are being produced annually or more than that. Um, getting your hand, uh, arms around what that really means uh, is kind of difficult. Uh, the way I did it was said, well, okay, that's actually 50 kilograms for every human on Earth. That's a lot, right? <laughs> every one of us owns about 110 pounds of plastics every year. Whoa, that's it's big. And we're not. And the real problem is that we're not recycling them, right? Um, most of them are being discarded. We incinerate about 25 percent of those uh, of the of the waste plastics or the discarded or end-of-use plastics um, and recycle a small amount globally and even less in the United States. So it, it is a big issue. Um, so that's the, that's the environmental issue, but there's also an energy issue, right? So if you think about how plastics are made today, they start off with fossil feedstocks, right? About 4% of the fossil feedstocks that we dig out of the ground, either oil or gas, is converted into uh, the precursors that go into uh, making plastics, right? About another 4%, 4 to 6% of those fossil feedstocks are used to generate the energy to make the, those feedstocks, the, the, the beads, the resin beads and things like that. So it's, it, it, uh, in terms of, it's competing with our currently primary source of energy in the United States. Um, it also has an energy impact, and I think this was mentioned already, it's about 10% of the global energy goes into plastic production. Recycling actually saves energy. It's, it's less energy to take uh, plastics that exist and convert them into new products, reform them into other plastic products than it is to go all the way from fossil feedstocks. So, so that's one of the incentives for doing this. Um, the real problem is that the current approaches for reusing uh, plastics or using plastics really have their limits. So we heard about biodegradation. I think you know that's something that we do need to consider just to keep the the, the um, plastics out of the environment. But the real problem is that that's not recycling, right? I mean, it, and it's creating greenhouse greenhouse gases. So. Uh, the same with incineration. You're creating byproducts that you don't really want. So um, mechanical recycling, that actually downgrades the polymers, right? The polymers, these uh, plastics are solids, right? To actually do anything with them, you have to heat them up. Uh, so the mechanical is that you clean them up and then you heat them up and uh, get them to where you can move them and extrude them into new forms, right? When you do that, actually, you start to break the bonds in the polymers. So there, this, this actually is a, it downgrades them. And so uh, you could actually call this, rather than recycling, downcycling, right? Um, so chemical recycling is actually thinking about chemical processes where you're trying to break the bonds and you're actually trying to break the bonds to get down to, new, to intermediates that you can then use to make new products, right? Um, current technologies are somewhat limited. Uh, things like pyrolysis, those are high temperature. Uh, in, in the absence of oxygen, you can create, at, uh, if you do it the right way, you can make what's called synthesis gas, H2 and CO, which is a feedstock that can be used uh, in catalytic processes to make fuels, for example, or other products. Um, it can be done in a way that creates liquids, but they're mixtures, very complex mixtures, right? of lots of different things. If you think about polymers, though, they're, you know, they're sequences, repeating sequences of monomers, right? And so you might think, well, maybe there's a better way to do that if you can figure out how to selectively clip bonds, 
right? You could create chunks that might be easier to work with in terms of, uh, terms of um, upcycling, right? So the upcycling then really is all about, uh, well, let me just talk about this for a second. So what we, we identified this as an issue that we thought was relevant to the Department of Energy, uh, and particularly BES, and we went after after it. We had a workshop that included uh, 23 participants from across industry, uh, um, academics, and national laboratories that came together to help us assess where fundamental science could move this area forward, how it could help us in terms of understanding the degradation processes of plastics at low temperatures now, moving towards low temperatures, and uh, how we could design new materials for doing this. So opportunities uh, out of this, you know, the, the goal that we have, uh, that we kind of distilled out of this workshop, was to provide the foundational knowledge that would allow us to really shift this paradigm of discarded plastics from being waste that end up in dumps or the environment to actually a resource that you can use to make new products. And so these four, these are the four uh, typical of the basic energy sciences workshops. We distill it down to priority research opportunities or directions. There are four of those. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute how you actually, there's a link at the bottom. You can find the brochure. We have a, just a four page brochure right now. The workshop report, full report is almost done. Um, so uh, let me just walk through these uh, three of these really quickly. Um, the, this master the mechanisms of polymer de deconstruction and reconstruction. So, you know, um, we learned how to make polymers uh, synthetically. I mean, nature's been doing it for eons, um, but uh, it's called cellulose, right? Um, but uh, in terms of these synthetic polymers, uh, that was, you know, probably over 50 years ago that we started doing that. And there's just the proliferation of the number of, of polymers that are being made and, and what they, you know, uh, their function. It, it, we've gotten really good at that. What we haven't really spent any time on is the opposite problem, right? How do you take them and, and start to take them apart? So that is the focus of this first priority research opportunity. It's, it's how do you deconstruct them? That's the first thing you need to learn how to do. And, you know, thinking about this, this is really just taking a simple single polymer at a time, right? And how do you start uh, thinking about um, moving that in a direction where you can create uh, components that you can use for something else? So this, uh, that, this example at the bottom is just one recent example of some, uh, some of the work. But again, this is fairly new types of things where you're able to do this at a relatively low temperature. You have to heat these things up. You think about this, right? You've got a solid, right? So you're going to have to heat it up some. And it's absolutely amazing. These are catalytic processes. So you have some catalyst. In this case, it's a solid. You're bringing it up, and you actually have a solid-solid interface. And the fact that you can have these kind of catalytic processes going on at relatively low temperatures are actually pretty amazing, but it, uh, it's, and it's very promising. The other piece of this is then what you'd like to do is rather than, you know, a two-step process, take this thing, tear it apart into chunks, and then take those chunks and rebuild, is actually can you figure out how to do it all at once? And this is work out of IBM. It's actually really neat. Uh, they took uh, a polycarbonate and uh, by adding an, a component, which is a polysophone, um, during the degradation process, they're actually able to reassemble that uh, to form a polysulfone, and, uh, which is a new polymer. Uh, again, I'm not sure exactly what it will do, but it's just a demonstration that these kind of things, one pot processes of taking an existing polymer and turning it into a new polymer is possible. Um, uh, but uh, as it's been pointed out, you know, these, these plastics are not sing single, simple uh, polymers, right? They're, they're mixtures of lots of things, right? So we need to figure out how to, uh, in, you know, dis how to design processes for dealing with the complexity of, of true plastics. 
So um, one, one approach is to think about how you can create catalysts that will only work on one component in a mix. So um, that's actually been done. Again, this is an IBM example, right? IBM uses a lot of plastics, right, and electronics. And so this Volcat process actually selectively out of, uh, takes um, uh, uh, materials that have a lot of contaminants, food residues, um, dyes, pigments, and those type of things, and can actually uh, selectively um, convert it into a clean uh, um, a resin beads. Um, that's, that's one piece of it. Uh, part, part of the other idea was how can we start to connect up separations processes more intimately with catalysts, right? Rather than separating something and then working on that, can you actually design coupled catalytic separation? And uh, so thinking about uh, reactive separations or catalytic separations. And the last is actually talking about um, um, actually embracing the complexity of your mixture and thinking about how you can use multiple components in a mixture to create new products. So all of these are ideas that came out and uh, not so much uh, to report on the last two pieces of that. And then the last is about creating uh, new polymers that you can use for upcycle, uh, for, uh, that will go through this recycling many times, right? So that it's, uh, they fall apart easily and then can be reconstructed. And so uh, the first example of that is one that uh, comes out of LBNL, and it's taking a fairly new type of polymer uh, that was designed, this diketo enamine, and uh, have shown that that actually you can do this with it. You can uh, deconstruct it and reconstruct in a circular manner many times, right? You can go through that cycle without downgrading it, right, through this chemical process. So that's a demonstration, right, that this is possible to do. The question is, though, can you actually do that and maintain the properties of the plastics that make them so valuable today, right, their durability, fact that they're inert and all of these. So that, I think, is the real trick. And, uh, and so I think the, uh, that is a challenge for the future. All right. So this is, uh, these, I talked about the first three of these. The last one is more about developing the tools. Those tools are experimental. And the, the real issue here is really understanding uh, the, the, the chemical processes um, in, in these degradation and reassemble processes, um, cycles. So uh, there's lots of different chemical reactions that can happen. And so how do we control the environment through the catalyst, through the temperature and pressure, through other things that you feed into that, so that you start to control how uh, the pathways through the, the, these complex mechanisms. And so having the tools experimentally we heard some about that yesterday in terms of, you know, the way that these uh, plastics are being characterized, but how can we actually now start looking at the way that they're being uh, transformed? Um, computational tools are critically important, all the way from simulations at the molecular level up through things like using modern data science techniques, machine learning type of approaches to take advantage of the data that's coming out of those to uh, inform us. And so that, uh, I think, is really a grand challenge. So I, I will say that this, you know, this is, this is a long-term <laughs> investment, right? This is not something that's going to happen overnight. And so uh, one of the things that we are doing is coordinating with other parts of DOE. Um, so we're in the Office of Science. There are uh, two other offices within the Office of Science besides BES, Advanced Scientific Computing and Biological Environmental Sciences. There's actually six. I only have three there because these are the three that are actually uh, have ideas about how to contribute. Uh, I mentioned already that computation is important. Um, thinking about biological processes, uh, I think, is important as we go forward. But maybe not just to degrade them, but actually thinking about can you come up with microbial consortium that actually not only degrade, but actually can rebuild them into something useful to us. And so uh, that biological environmental research 
does more fundamental research, more kind of in the synthetic biology, uh, using by, um, uh, by, by uh, the word is slipping me, but uh, um, <laughs> omics, there we go, uh, type of techniques, and, and developing those kind of approaches that you can start to, to engineer systems to do that. Um, the Office of in Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy is a more, um, supports more applied research that's closer to the technologies. And so uh, we're working closely with them. And then uh, the uh, ARPA-E is uh, starting to think about things that they can do in this area as well. So there's coordination between all those pieces. We think it's important. Back in November, the Department of Energy issued this uh, Plastics Innovation Challenge. And it covers a broad range. So, you know, if you think about it, there's three, the three in the middle of this, uh, the de deconstruction, upcycling, and design for recyclability. We're, we're contributing to that at a very fundamental level. E ERE also contributes to that. Uh, but more uh, taking uh, more, uh, I think we're taking more of a kind of a clean slate, right, to start off. Uh, from the, you know, looking at a brand new type of approaches to those. They're looking more at things like how can you improve pyrolysis or their type of, bio and they're looking at biological processes. So I think there's good connection there. We can uh, un understand from them what some of the uh, hurdles are in terms of pushing those technologies forward. But at the same time, uh, they can learn from us about maybe promising things that can be moved up. And ultimately, uh, this piece of commercialization, there's partnerships now being formed with uh, industry uh, to start to figure out um, how, you know, how some of this can be transitioned there to help move that forward. Um, so there's lots, uh, they, they have been funding things, uh, having workshops as well uh, in this area. Um, they've uh, launched uh, this bio-optimized technologies to keep plastics out of landfills in the environment. They love these acronyms. <laughs> but it's great. I, this is actually, uh, this is a lab consortium that just got started in, uh, I think, in, in, uh, this year, um, or this fiscal year. Um, there's currently a call for proposals out of what's called the Remade Institute, which is about recycling more broadly, but it includes plastic pieces. And, uh, and then uh, this is what we're doing in this area. We have a, an ongoing solicitation that's open all year. Um, that that uh, these, All of these explicitly include calls for research in polymer upcycling. Okay. Uh, we have an early career program that's targeted at uh, people that are uh, within 10 years of their PhD. And uh, again, so uh, there are opportunities that uh, we're putting out now to, to start funding more and more research in this area. Again, this is a new area for us. I'll just bring to your attention that we do have this Office of Science Graduate Research Program that's aimed at uh, Help getting students from universities engaged in national laboratory research. There's funding associated with this, and I think there are good opportunities in the polymer upcycling space going forward. So this is my last slide. I'm going to uh, just leave it up. I uh, just point out uh, the three bullets at the bottom. I think um, this, this will, I think, enable... Uh, reduction of the plastics that are going into the environment. Um, I think it will help decouple plastics production from the fossil feedstocks over time and ultimately decrease the energy cost of plastic production. So with that, if I have time for questions, I'll take some. We have time for a question. Yes. Uh, Brett Howard, American Chemistry Council, thank you for uh, just a, a fantastic talk. I'm curious if the uh, DOE has explored or is familiar with the efforts for uh, polymer degradation uh, using a radical process with supercritical water. I think there's some uh, research uh, from Linda Wang at Purdue uh, that's really intriguing. It's not uh, catalytic. Uh, I'm curious if you guys have looked into that at all. Um, I personally am unaware of that. Uh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. Um, I know supercritical water has been used. So it's, water is uh, 
surprisingly reactive medium <laughs> when you get it up uh, past the critical point. So it's, it, I think that's uh, it's good. Those kind of things would be good opportunities to look at going forward. And uh, just one uh, final comment. I wanted to say uh, it's great that uh, I'm an alum of uh, UC Irvine. Glad to see uh, Dr. Zeeb and Guan's uh, Iridium Catalyst uh, work. <laughs> Glad that's on your radar. So awesome. Yep. Quick question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Patrick McMullen from Cytovation. Um, I mean, you mentioned, in fact, you have it here, did, you know, the, the decreased energy cost of plastic production, uh, taking advantage of upcycling. You, you mentioned even kind of the conventional downcycling has, has energy benefits. Are there, are there other, and it might be too early to ask this, other potential economic incentives uh, for upcycling beyond that decreased energy cost? Or is this something that we would, from a policy standpoint, have to uh, incentivize people to adopt? Yeah, so um, if there was somebody from EERE here, I'm sure they could answer that question. I, you know, they, they bring in things like life cycle analysis, techno-economic analysis into a lot of what they do, right, which is essential um, in terms of helping kind of drive uh, the more immediate uh, development of, of approaches that can turn into technology. We take a step back from that, and we don't use it because sometimes it can keep you away from things that uh, may not look promising today, but they can be really disruptive in the future. So, so I don't have a good answer to you. <laughs> so. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.